we're going to begin our new series that we're titling Rooted in Galatians. Rooted in Galatians. And uh, I want to talk to you about the first problem today, the first problem that we encounter as we read the book, the first problem that Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, the first problem he tackles. He's not on the defensive. Every commentary that I read seems to talk about Paul's defense. He's not on the defensive. He's very much uh, attacking from the get-go of the book, and we'll see that in a moment. So if you open your Bibles, we'll, we'll get to uh, chapter 1. We'll stay in, in chapter 1, read a few verses in chapter 2, but we won't get into details into chapter 2. So don't feel like I'm covering all of this and I'm not going to get into the details. Um, we'll, we'll talk about chapter 2 in, in weeks to come. Why this series, though? Well, you see, we have a responsibility to give an answer. Give an answer for the hope that we have, for the practices that we embrace. You, many years ago, I had a, a guy online wanting to debate me. And he had a doctor's degree, well-versed in Greek. And, and I, I knew I knew this is, this is something that you, you will hear me from time to time to, that, that I will say to you. I don't know. I am going to research it. And I'm going to study. I don't, as of right now, I don't have the answers to that. And so I knew that there were things in the book of Galatians that at the time I didn't know how to answer. And so I declined his invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem humbling myself and, and letting you know where I'm at. I don't, I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. I wanted to address this, though, because not because we, we have problems similar to the ones that we see in Galatians, but because this is an area of strength for us, actually. And I just want to make a good thing better. And also, for those of you who've joined us recently to know where we stand. The, the letter to the Galatians is considered the very first writing of the New Covenant Scriptures. And the reason is because this problem arose early on. So they had to address it. And... This, by the Spirit of God, the way that it was addressed came out to be actually part of Scripture. It came out to be inspired. The, there are hints in the book, and we'll see them some, some of those today, that this was not the first time that Paul was dealing with the problems in Galatians. He, he, he already, this is a, a, a conversation that was ongoing, even as he was writing. The, the, the congregations that are, that are known as the Galatians is actually a series of congregations, probably three, maybe even more, that we see Shaul as he went out into his, uh, he was sent out from the congregation of Antioch, outside of the, the land of Israel, just to the north, probably somewhere between Syria and, and, and Turkey, and they got on a boat and they went down to the isle, to the, to the island of, um, uh, it's, uh, let's see, to, what was that island? Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here in terms of the name of the island. It'll come back to me in a moment, right? Uh, they, they went to this island and they had mild success. Then they went up north, straight up to what's Turkey today. They went synagogue after synagogue, bringing the good news that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. Cyprus is the island, yes, the island of Cyprus. Sometimes the Spanish get into my head. 
and the Hebrew sometimes came to, to my head, and then I, I don't have anything. <laughs> my wife can tell you about that. <laughs> and so they went up to what is today Turkey, and they went to three, to three synagogues, back to back to back, where they were kicked out. It, it, it actually even stoned to the point of they were, he, he was left for dead. Yeah. And later on, these, these, kind, these places actually had a, a heavy population of Gentiles who had attached themselves to the congregations, to, to the uh, synagogues, who were God-fearers. There were a number of them who had done conversion, who had converted to Judaism, but there were also a number of them who had not taken that step yet. And these took that message of good news really, really well, and they began to gather around the, the, uh, the other uh, um, disciples that accompany Paul, Barnabas, the main one, and these congregations began to flourish very early on. They had great teaching from Shaul himself, from Barnabas, uh, Ty, uh, uh, Timothy later on joined the team. So they had received the, the truth, the, the good news of the gospel straight from great teachers. But after they had left and gone into other places to minister, some other people came in. And that's some of the problems that we see. So Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. We're going to see here that, there, that Paul begins to deal with the first problem, which is the problem, the, the, the main problem they had. It was a gospel problem. They had a gospel problem problem. Galatians 1.1 1, 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of men, but through Yeshua the Messiah and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the Messianic communities of Galatia. You see, from the beginning, Paul begins to, to unleash an attack on the arguments of those who were opposing him. There are two arguments that we see here that he is counteracting. Number one was about his authority as an apostle. In order to diminish the importance of his message, they have to diminish the authority that he had. And so they, they were spreading false information about him and about his apostleship by saying that he, had, he was a latecomer, that he had not walked with Yeshua, that the apostles who were back in Jerusalem were the real ones, that he was kind of like a, a fake apostle. And so he comes straight and he says, not sent from men. Why does he say that? The reason he says that is because the guys who were spreading these false arguments about him, they were sent by men. They were sent with a message from Jerusalem by other men. They were not sent directly from Yeshua. And so he says, my apostleship Unlike your credentials, my apostleship is not from men. Amen. It is through Yeshua, yes. by the will of the Father, yes. by a decree of the Father. And in verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who gave himself for our sins so that, we, that, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. According to the will of God, to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. 
he begins to lay out his argument that grace and peace is what the Galatians need. Why grace and peace? See, the word peace, the word shalom, comes from the word shalem, that means to be complete. It doesn't primarily mean peace. It means peace in the sense that you have peace when you understand that you are complete. That you lack nothing in, in Yeshua. That's what the Galatians needed. Because someone in a group of people had come to their midst telling them, you lack something. You are not complete in Messiah. You see how purposeful, even to the greeting, even to, to the details of the greeting, Shaul has to be. And obviously, they need a grace. They needed to understand it is through Messiah giving himself for our sins that God gives the grace that we need in order to be accepted by him. You see, every time that a sacrifice is prescribed in the Torah, when it is done correctly, it says, it, it, it says over and over again that it will be pleasing to the Lord. That it will be pleasing to the Lord. Can you hear that song? May it be pleasing to you, Lord. And that's what Yeshua is. Yeshua is the sacrifice that is pleasing to the Father. And so we are accepted in him. Nothing else. Ephesians says that we were created for good works. Created in Messiah for good works. Not because of good works. But for good works. Good works have a place. But they're not the origin of God's favor. And so Paul is making this very clear from the get-go, from the beginning of his message. Verse 6, he, he begins now the, the body of, of his arguments. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who has called you by the grace of Messiah. The word amazed means to be disturbed. I'm greatly disturbed that you are deserting God. In the Torah, there is a prescription for a person who would come alongside and will tell people, hey, let's worship the gods of the other nations. There is a prescription for such a person. They are to be executed. It brings death to entice fellow Jews to worship false gods. And that's what Paul says here. Uh, in verse 9, he says, As we have said before, I, I, so I say again. Now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received... He is to be accursed, separate from Messiah, doomed and damned. Death. Why? Because he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. You're abandoning him. You, it, the, the root of this word is the word for repentance. You've changed your mind and you've changed your position. You've turned away from him, from him, from him who called you. This, he makes it personal. This is relational with God by you believing 
what they've told you and following their, their, their course and path for you, you've actually deserted him. That is not small. That's big. And he says, not only do you desert him, but you desert him so quickly. In other words, this, this means that you, you didn't even examine the evidence. They presented some arguments to you, and you just took it in and went with it. I'm, I'm disturbed that you've done that. And he says that you... You deserting him who called you by the grace of Messiah for a different gospel. For a different gospel. Which is really not another one. It's not a, there is no such thing as a different gospel. It's a non-entity. It's, an, it's non-existing. He says, only there are some who are disturbing you and who want to distort the gospel. If there is anything other than the real gospel... It is a distorted gospel, a distorted message that actually disturbs, that create in, creates instability. And he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he, he, he is to be a curse. This is a message that is contrary. This word contrary, you, you know this word, in the Greek is para. As in paraclete. We get the word paralegal from it. Or parallel. When you have a line parallel to another, it means they never become the same. They never join. They're se- they have a separate identity. And they never join. And so much so that at some point they may actually become the opposite of each other. And that's what Paul is saying. That this gospel, which is not a real gospel, which is a distortion of the real gospel, actually is the opposite of the real message of good news. Of the real besora, the real good news of acceptance through Yeshua. Look what he says in Galatians 2 4. Again, we're going to read a few verses in Galatians 2, but don't think that we're not going to return to Galatians 2. We're going to come back to Galatians 2 in proper time and, and, read, and read them carefully. 2 4 it says, uh, But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Messiah Yeshua, in order to bring us into bondage. That was the goal. That's how contrary this gospel is, this false gospel. To spy our our liberty in order to bring us into bondage. In Romans 16, 17, we have have an explanation of what this word contrary means. It says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissension and hindrance contrary to the teaching which you learn and turn away from them. This word contrary is the same word. Those who create dissension contrary to our teaching turn away from them. They have turned away from the Lord. You can turn away from them. Acts 15.1 talks about this being played in action. It says, Some men came down from Judea and began, to, began teaching the brethren... Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That is the heart of this disturbing and distorted gospel. Unless you are circumcised. What this means is, 
full conversion to Judaism from Gentiles who want to approach the God of Israel. That was the message. That's what circumcision means. That's what circumcision according to the custom of Moses. Or in other words, according to the teaching of the sages. People falsely accused Shaul, saying that he was against the teaching of the sages. And he was not. He just dissented from them. If you read the Mishnah, <laughs> it's just a series of arguments showing you that they didn't agree on everything. Far from it. On anything. On anything right? It actually, if it made it into the Mishnah, the reason why it made it, it is because there are more than one views. The things in which they were perfectly in agreement, they didn't have to write about it. So the only road, because there were differences of opinion. And in fact, there is a story uh, told by Josephus at the end of the first century. He was a, a Pharisee, actually a, a Cohen. And he tells a story that had happened probably earlier in, in the first century tells a story of a foreign king, a Gentile king, who had actually uh, come to appreciate the teachings of the Torah. And the man who shared about the Torah with him counseled him against converting. And he said, because you are a king, if you convert to Judaism and you he was actually a prince, so his father was really soon to die. So he said, it's, it's actually not a good idea for you to convert. Because you're going to reign over really a bunch of people who are still pagan. And when they see that you are not, that, that you are doing different practices, that you're not doing idolatry, because now you are a Jew... That's not going to be good for you as a king of this nation. And so they may actually made a way for him to be a God-fearer, to hold back from conversion. And it was perfectly okay. We see those uh, God-fearers all over the Greek world. Gentiles who attended the synagogue and even helped the, the tithe and they gave money they prayed at the times of prayer. They, pray, they prayed Jewish prayers. But they did not fully convert. A little time later, somebody else came and persuaded this king to actually convert. But the story is told so that we can see. It's told by Josephus. So we can see that there were actually these two opinions, even in the first century. And it is so good to have that because it illustrates precisely what's going on here in Galatia. Because what Paul is embracing is the first view of the first man who, to, 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 who ministered to this king. There is absolutely no need for conversion, for Gentiles to convert. But then those who came afterwards said, as we just read in Acts 15, 1, unless you, are sick, unless you convert, you cannot be saved. And that is a distortion of Yeshua's message. What is the gospel then? Seems kind of crucial that we define and understand what is the good news. What is the Besoa? Of Yeshua, the good news of Yeshua. Well, in Galatians 2 5, Paul said, But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel will remain with you. What is the truth of the gospel? Well, if we read it in context, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then after an, an interval of 14 years, I went up again 
to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. Barnabas is a Jew, Titus is not. Verse 2, it was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did, I did so in private to those who were of reputation to the, to the apostles for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, non-Jew, Gentile, was compelled, not even him was compelled to be circumcised, to make conversion. They, they saw him and they were okay with him not doing conversion. They understood that God had accepted him fully without him having to convert. So that's when he says, verse 4, But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Messiah Yeshua, in order to bring us into bondage, but we did not yield in subjection to them. What would have meant for them to have yielded? To do conversion for Titus. So Paul said, not even for an hour. I'm not even going to consider your arguments. They're not valid. They're not necessary. Why? Well, in Acts 15, verse 6, we read, The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my, by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's referring to Cornelius in the book of Acts, chapter 10 and 11, where an angel came to Peter and told him, I need you to go and not consider this man unclean. But go into his house, even though he's a Gentile, go into his house and give the message that I have for you. Verse 8. And God, who knows the heart, test, uh, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, between Jew and Gentile, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test? By placing upon the neck of the disciples, of the Gentile disciples, a yoke, the custom of Moses, the traditions of the elders, placing on them, uh, on the... Uh, on the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Seems hypocritical yeah. that we would ask them to live and to do things that we ourselves have a hard time doing. Right? He concludes, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Yeshua in the same way as they are also. Amen. So they thought they had all this cleared up, wrapped up, decided, but they had all their battles to, to fight for this. In 1 Corinthians, Paul also addresses this. Verse 17, he says, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner, let him walk. And he says, and I also direct in all the, con the congregations. Or in other versions say, I, this is my rule in all the congregations. What will be that rule? Do you know what this rule is? What is the rule that Paul said, I give this rule in every congregation? Wouldn't that be important? I mean, if he taught this one rule in every congregation, how come we don't know it? <laughs> so what is this rule then? All right. Verse 18. Was any man called 
when he was already circumcised? In other words, were you called as a Jew? Or were you called after you converted to Judaism? Was any man called when he, or he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. So remain as a Jew. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? So has anyone been called to believe in the Messiah, to believe in the God of Israel as a Gentile? If you were called this way, here's Paul's rule. He is not to be circumcised. He is not to convert to Judaism. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. Now we need to understand this statement. Yeshua says, listen, if you don't hate mother and father, you can't be my disciple. Amen. And now we understand this is kind of exaggerated way of speaking. He didn't actually say, listen, one of my requirements for discipleship is that you have hatred in your heart and that you exercise this hatred every day towards your parents. He, that's not what he meant. <laughs> this is a Hebraic way of speaking. What he meant is, listen, your love for God needs to be so much greater for you to, to do his will and to follow his commandments that in comparison it almost looks like you, you hate your parents. In other words, we make choices out of love for our children that they sometimes swear that we hate them. <laughs> they will swear we hate them <laughs> because we know what is good for them and we make decisions based on what is good for them. That's what he's saying. So Paul is not saying, listen, circumcision absolutely is nothing. No, what he's saying is, in comparison, in, in the right context, you have to understand that being a Jew is not more important than being a Gentile. So when it comes to receiving the message of salvation, the gospel, the good news of Yeshua, it is the same whether you are a Jew or not. So in that regard, he is saying, it is secondary. It is secondary. He says, but what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. You see, he's not dishing out Judaism. He's not leaving behind the Torah. No. On the contrary, he's saying, what's important is keeping the commandments. Now, a person may say, yeah, but one of the commandments is circumcision. Oh. <laughs> and to that, the answer to that is, in Judaism, circumcision is for a Jew or for conversion, period. It's either you were born a Jew and you circumcise your, your child, your, your boy, or you convert. You have to understand, you can you can't look at the commandments outside of the context of Judaism. You have to, to honor that these commandments have been understood for thousands of years in a certain way. And even Paul understands it means conversion. That's what it means. So he says no, no to conversion. He says each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. That's Paul's rule in every congregation. A Jew remains a Jew. A Gentile remains a Gentile. Amen. We're both all accept, accepted by God. Amen. Just as we are. Amen. That's his rule. Amen. So why is it important that we study this? Well, you see, the problem in, in the, the congregations 
at the time in, and in the region of Galatians, the problem and the question they had was, on what basis are Gentiles accepted into the promises of the Jewish people? This problem was solved. It was actually overcorrected. And it was turned upside down in less than a century. You realize the question became, on what basis can Jews be accepted into the blessings of the church? Wow. 100% turned upside down. So it started out as, can we really accept Gentiles here? To, can we really accept Jews here? So we need to understand the nature of the problem in Galatia and the solution to it. Because we're at the forefront of rest restoring the truth of the gospel. This rule of Paul. That not only it is okay to remain a Jew and to remain a Gentile, but you must do it. It's a, it's a rule. It's a commandment. So we need to understand the nature of this epistle of, of the Galatians. We actually have a, a, a danger of overcorrecting also. Because one of the dangers that we thankfully have come a long ways in avoiding here as to God, one of the dangers in the Messianic movement is not so much to tell Gentiles they must convert, but the problem is to tell Gentiles you lack something. You, you lack a keeper. You, brother, you, you need to put on a talit. You, you need to imitate. You, you need to kind of look Jewish, imitate Jewishness. You see how it can go over correct and go to the other side now? We have to understand the nature of this. It comes from one's identity being confused. The solution is to understand God saved me as a Jew. God saved me as a Gentile. He doesn't want me to change that. It is faith in the Messiah. And then follow the commandments of God. That's what counts. You can't have... A one new man, Jew and Gentile, one in the Messiah. You can't have that. You can't have Jew and Gentile if you don't have Gentiles. If all the Gentiles become Jews, <laughs> you don't have Gentiles. <laughs> you don't have the one new man. Just like for 2,000 years, they said, we can't have Jews here. So it was all Gentiles. Wrong. So we can't go over correcting and go on, uh, to the other side of the issue. You see the gospel problem and how key it is for us to understand it. So that we can make what is good here at Sukkot even better. Amen. We have a, a role to play in our movement to be a congregation that is a pattern that is leading that is showing an example of how to be mature dealing with these issues and not be confused in our identity amen amen